Hi, everybody. First of three lectures in this particular module, we're going to try and keep them as short and snappy as possible for you. And what I want to do is talk firstly about colonialism in this particular lecture. So let's just let's just get started with that. Eh? Um, so here we get this sense of of a famous poem by Rudyard Kipling about colonialism and um, and the need to take up the white man's burden. I'll let you read that at your own um, at your own leisure. But uh, let's. Let's get things going. So if we start to then think about the purpose of what I want to talk about here, to en enhance an appreciation of the concept of colonialism and its practices. I want to say appreciate, I don't mean jolly good, well done, any of that kind of thing, but more about it, it's a real kind of meaning of the term of appreciation, of giving things their due value. And there's no doubt that <laughs> colonialism has had an incredible impact on the world and continues, that, that, that impact continues to have its ramifications. So that's part of what I want to um, to think about here is to investigate its practices, thought about, to contemplate its implications, and to get out of this a deepened understanding of European colonialism and its varying impacts on colonized people in different parts of the world. Now to talk about it as, as depth is um, a misnomer in some ways. You could do a whole unit, you could do a whole course, you could do a whole degree on colonialism. I'm, not going to, I'm obviously not going to be doing that here. So it's really about getting at some, some of the essence of the, of the notion of colonialism, its practices, its ramifications, um, in order to, to understand some of the great changes that have taken place in the last few centuries, couple of centuries in, um, in, in the world, um, five or six centuries probably. Key concepts, colonialism, types of colony, want to, to visit that. Notions of social Darwinism, the white man's burden, the frontier also is something that's worth thinking about in all of this. So what is colonialism? Drawing lines on a map, and here's Africa with all of the lines that got drawn upon it by those who were deciding who got what at various meetings of the colonial forces of European nations at that time. And here's a map. I always think maps with outlines are really quite profound to, um, to contemplate. And I wonder if you recognize this, this place. You can just see here the northern tip of Australia. And up above it is the island that's sometimes known as New Guinea. Uh, in, um, and it's in relation with that uh, this place is, is um, you know, so th this island colonized by various people, but it's the, we need to understand its contemporary relationships in relation to Europe and also to Australia, because believe it or not, Australia did have a colony and it was a place called Papua, called Papua New Guinea at the time. Um, so the first line that gets drawn is in 1828 when the Dutch drew a line straight down the middle there, as you can see, West Irian on one side, Papua New Guinea on the other, the Dutch claiming the western side of this island and, it, and its islands and its archipelagos. And then in, um, eight, in uh, 1884, the Germans and the English reached an agreement to split the country with a line running as it does with the northern half going to the German uh, nation and England taking hold of the southern parts of the um, so this actually became known as Papua, the, the British part, and above the, the part above it, the German part, New Guinea, is how it got how it got known at the time. So when we start to think about what is colonialism, we can start to think about the political, social, economic, and cultural domination of a territory and its people by a foreign power for an extended period of time, as Kotak puts it. And of course, there's myriad definitions of what colonialism is. But I think key there is the domination of territory and people, foreign power for an extended time. And it's, it's a people taking charge of a country from a distance. I mean, it might be a fairly short distance in some instances, but in many instances, 
they could be a long way away, as of course Papua New Guinea, Australia, New Zealand were from the, um, the British and German nations and Dutch nations that had some control over them. It's important to think about a period of history where we move from mercantile colonialism to capitalist colonialism. So Europe started off with merch, you know, it was it was a merchandise, a, a, a mercantile colonialism. It was built, built on um, merchants going and getting products from from the colonies and bringing them back. The Spice Islands, of course, in the case of the Dutch going into Indonesia. And then we can think about the British East India Company and its uh, profound impacts on, on India and the, uh, the enormous wealth it generated at the time through its uh, uses of the resources of the colony, resources of various sorts. Capitalism starts to take greater and greater hold, particularly industrial capitalism. And that becomes a mercantile capitalism to, to um, to um, industrial capitalism is worth thinking about in all of this. And um, that is really the period that we're most focused on in this unit. So there are, of course, different, many different types of colonialism. They stretch right back in, in time. We can, I think immediately of Rome and, and it's stretching across the, the known world as it was then. Um, profound in its implications, but for this unit at this time, we're particularly interested in the capitalist colonialism era. Um, now, Europe is an important region of human civilization, as uh, Holmes, Shim, and Gillian are writing here in, the, in their uh, piece about Australian society. It's, it, it is not because it's more or less interesting than societies and civilizations, civilizations that have existed elsewhere in the world, but because it was from Europe that colonial capitalism spread throughout the world. And few parts of the modern world are untouched by this colonial domination, and so to understand the modern world is largely to understand the Europeans and the forms of society that they have exported. But of course, it is to understand it in interactions with the worlds, the, the, the peoples, the nations as they became, that they came to dominate through these practices. So colonialism is a practice. It's a Western expansion. Peoples incorporated into a conquering state to greater and lesser extents. And largely, this is built out of violence or at least the threat of violence. We see a reordering of social structures and of resource use in these places, um, often with resources being plundered out of the place, taken back for profit into, <clears throat> into European nations. And often it's a relationship that gets built on distinction between the conqueror and the conquered, often through the establishment of some sort of a color bar where the, uh, the, black, the whites and the blacks are kept separate by various either legal means or customary means, the ways in which these different things happened. So if we start to think then about in, in this in terms of the logic of capitalism, the importance of putting inserting this into our thinking, capitalism is a, is a for profit um, or, uh, enterprise, it's not for any form of balanced reciprocity, or not not in its um, in its larger aims and domains, it does require reciprocity, and sometimes that is balanced, but it is about extracting profit from sites and from peoples. So it's a relation built on dominance and exploitation. It is not one that is seeking mutuality in, in, in some of its grosser forms, at least. Of course, there have to be those relations that are in there and get built in and around it. But there is a logic in capitalism that's um, important to bear in mind. So capitalism, colonialism, hand in glove relationship, important to understand that for what we're thinking about here. And if we think about colonial purposes, commercial, as already indicated uh, in the Dutch Indi East Indies Company, the, the British uh, East India Company and what it was about. Um, and then we get, um, and, and of course, become all sorts of other ways in which people come to seek profit out of, out of the colonies. Strategic, the Dutch established the colony in South Africa, not, not for its riches, they knew nothing about that, but because it was a great watering hole on the way through to the Spice Islands. Uh, when the British took it over, it was also for strategic purposes, often for military purposes, to try and make sure that they could defend some of their sea lanes, their sea routes. Um, they didn't, again, know about the fabulous wealth that was going to come out of South Africa, um, which it duly delivered. Um, missionary activity is also significant in all of this. So you've got a, a, a Christian Europe uh, that is seeking to spread the word to go forth and to teach all nations as it is as is as they're extolled to do in the Bible. And the thing to bear in mind with, of course, in missionary activities is <clears throat> this is a group of people 
who in some instances certainly act, acted as a bulwark against the uh, some of the excesses of colonial force um, and came to protect people because of course what the missionaries did and were very vested in doing was living with people. So they became, um, um, you know, implicated in all sorts of relationships in those settings, but they were also very focused on changing the societies that they became part of. You know, the, the merchants are indifferent to that, providing that they're getting what they need out of the places that they've gone to, but the missionaries are intent on change. Addressing domestic problems, we all know about, um, we all know about penal settlements in Australia and, and in other parts of the world probably as well. Um, but say Germany, for example, it was grew interested in colonialism as a way of giving people of, uh, of, of limited means in Germany an opportunity to better themselves. And at that time, they were very concerned about the growing interest and the growing um, uh, sense of ferment being, um, by being, put, being instilled into German society through socialism. So they're very concerned about the turn to socialism at that time. So be, the, the colonies became a way to perhaps ameliorate some of those problems. Status, nations get status out of being in the colonies and people of course get status by becoming um, rulers, mini despots in, in some instances out of being in these places. They, it's a way of rapidly rising up social scales. And of course, there's going to be curiosity and adventure mixed in with all of this um, uh, that, that is part of this colonial enterprise. The sorts of transformations we should keep an eye on and, and be aware of, the disruption in population equilibrium and deterioration in health that was often, uh, that often accompanied the colonists uh, coming into places, the bringing of, of, of exotic diseases as they would have been at that time. We, we probably know, you probably know something about the devastation of smallpox in Australia. Well, that, that was happening in a number of parts of the world for one example. You get the upsetting of political and ecological balances that were in place. So the, the, there's a disturbance in, in uh, those elements. So it, the, it causes disruption in societies in all sorts of ways. There's a loss of subsistence in many instances, as particularly as people get pushed in towards, um, say, uh, into plantation economies, which uh, take over the lands that were once used to generate a variety of food. And suddenly you've got just coconuts in front of you or bananas or whatever it may be. Um, not, the, not the sort of stuff for a balanced diet, for example. So whereas before there was a subsistence economy in many places, um, there is a loss of that. And a moving into a cash economy, and then doing that, in, that movement, of course, means that people become more exploitable as workers in settings like that. There's a loss of economic opportunities and op, uh, uh, options and autonomy that happens accompanying some of the things being described there. And that's especially regarding land rights and resource use. They become the property of the colonizer. Reduction of cultural autonomy and self-determination. Again, you can see, I think, how that gets all linked in, if, especially if you think about something like the loss of subsistence, but also the movement of political rights and the drawing of color bars and so on and all that that brings. The creation, uh, and in some instances, also the exacerbation of social inequalities. They were already there, but they get compounded. They also can get changed. People who um, were perhaps not as favored in, in the previous regime, the pre-colonial regimes, may find themselves in more favorable positions in, in this uh, particular instance too. So it shifts the inequalities of society. Mary Cuba, writing about a place that I know quite well because I actually lived uh, um, in this particular area, the Sepik frontier, the, and around the Catholic missions, in fact, for two and a half years in the 80s when I was working as a volunteer there. They write of the, you know, these three different groups, the government officials, the missionaries, and the indigenous people in this uh, tense relationship often um, between them. And I mean, that could, that could go both ways. It, it required both cooperation, but often caused a great deal of conflict. And she very deliberately places the traders outside of this triangle. They were largely indifferent to those social relations. They were moving in and through territory in order to trade goods, you know, to, to, to extract the goods they wanted in exchange for whatever it was that they had on offer in, in those places. Whoops, didn't quite mean to do that. Um, now, let's just have a quick think about some of the ideologies underpinning this. So if you go to colonize the people, you're probably not going to want to see them as equals because that gets pretty hard to justify, especially in a 
post-enlightenment society, you know, a society that prides itself on the equality of all humans. You're going to have to find ways of, to, to do it, you've got to somehow see the people you're taking over as lesser in some ways. Social Darwinism was certainly a prominent idea at that time. It's a bit misnamed because it's not really Darwinist in, in, its strict, in the strict sense of the word. On the origin of species gets produced in 1859. And we get a notion of the application of this concept of evolution. So again, the origin of species captured some of the thinking of that time. So it didn't just come out of nowhere. But you get the application of the concept of evolution to historical developments of human societies, which lays particular emphasis on the struggle for existence and the survival of the fittest. So it's applying this now into social settings. And we get these very simple unilineal evolutionary models that develop out of this. Now, this is where it's not very Darwinian. Darwin, Darwin's evolution does not occur in a nice straight line, it does not occur in progress. It happens through a variety, a variety of accidents or whatever you want to call it, random events that happen around some of the, the changes taking place in society. But we get a notion of this idea being applied into social settings, of course, is often um, post hoc, often being applied to the situation to help explain how um, the colonists have been able to get into the position they did. And they'd be thinking about moving from simple societies to complex societies, the need to move people from their primitive state into the modern state from savage to civilized. That sort of what appears now to be really quite atrocious language, but was taken as a common sense understanding of the world at that time. To give you some example of this, perhaps somebody who's very quoted, much loved as somebody, you know, much loved um, by many, uh, somebody to quote, um, <laughs> In, uh, as being you know, witty and uh, insightful. Well, here's a quote you, you might care to throw back at people sometime. Um, I do not agree with that the dog in the manger has the final right to the manger, even though he may have lain there for a long time. I do not admit that right. I do not admit, admit for instance, that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the Black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly wise race, to put it that way, has come in and taken their place. One Winston Churchill, former Prime Minister of England, which I'm sure many of you are still aware. So we get this notion of the rhetoric of colonialism, the kinds of justifications taking place, the discourse of civilization that we can hear in Churchill's idea. White man's burden, um, Kipling's poem was an exhortation to America to take up the, colo the, colo the, to take up the colonies left vacant by the Spanish in and around their part of the world. Um, a Puerto Rico, for example, take it up. Don't give them independence. They need to be led into a more civilized way. So you get, a, it's a very influential set of ideas and the poem captures that. And the variations in practice are also worth thinking about though. And that depends that lies to some extent on the size and the type of society colonized and also the particular historical period in question. Ideas move along uh, with history as well. So it becomes um, more problem problematic in, 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 instance, in many instances as uh, you know, Western thought develops in its own particular ways to be colonists. So they've got to keep sort of working out new ways of engaging, I think you at this. As I say, you can do a whole course on this and I, I wish I could go into more detail, but I won't. We need to think about the location of the land in relation to the colonizers. If you're ruling at a distance, it's quite, that's, so it's quite different to rule Australia to ruling Ireland, for example, if you're British. And what the colonizers were after. So as I say, if, you, if you're in Australia for strategic purposes, you're not really looking for the gold that you find later, then you, what you're doing in the place is different. And then you also need to think about the policies and the politics of the colonizers. And each of the European nations did it differently and had different effects and different impacts. And the ways in which they incorporated people into their, into their greater nation, for example, is, is one of the things that you could, you could certainly look at and explore, should you care to write on this topic at a, at a later point. Um, but when we think about the, the type of society, just going back to that, that point, you know, a hunter-gatherer society is in a different position to, uh, so thinking about Australia and say, compare that with a horticultural society, you know, much more densely populated parts of New Zealand or, or Papua New Guinea. 
Um, and so the ways in which the colonizers take over land in, in those situations can be quite different. Um, there was armed, armed uh, 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 violence taking place on all of the frontiers, but the frontiers were more intense in places like New Zealand or more spread in, in Australia. And there's different types of military organization that comes, that, that, that precedes the coloni colonizing process as a consequence of that. And perhaps there's an essay to be written here for some of you comparing, say, Australia and New Zealand, um, uh, the colonial experience in both places. The types of colony then, let's just, let's just get to that because that picks up the idea I've just been talking about. You get the notion of a settler colony versus an invader colony. So the settler colonies, the invading Europeans and their descendants became a majority or non-indigenous population. So that's Argentina, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, USA, etc. There are a number of other places. That's as opposed to the non-settler, sometimes called invader colonies, the indigenous population vastly greater than the settlers or the invaders. So Papua New Guinea, for example, Vietnam, India, and so on. And then we've got the mixed colonies where a significant number of settlers are there, but they never achieve majority status. So thinking there, say, about South Africa, uh, Zimbabwe, as it is known now, but was Rhodesia at the time as two examples of that and the different ways in which those colonial practices have, have taken hold there. So we think about noticing the differences. What are the differences in experience for colonized people in settler and non-settler uh, colonies? Again, I'm not running the module, the unit on this, but it is worth just thinking about what's the difference for a, um, a hunter-gatherer society as opposed to a horticultural society. Um, <clears throat> or of course, societies such as India that were organized along much stronger uh, with much stronger sets of polity and of rulers in place than perhaps we could see in some uh, uh, say a horticultural society or a, a, um, a hunter-gatherer society. Um, how do you explain these differences? Well of course we've got a variety there's a number of variables to consider um, but certainly um, the different things going on in these in these different places produce very different results and to what do you attribute these differences? become important questions to ask. Population density is clearly important in here. Modes of adaptation, as I've already started to talk about, the difference to see between, say, a hunter-gatherer, a horticulturalist, a peasant society, um, however the societies are organized, you're going to get different ways in which um, the Europeans took hold and used the local polities in order to rule and govern. Um, and then, of course, the important, other important aspect to pick up are the labor needs of the colonizing government. What are they seeking out of the place? How intense does it need to be? Um, and if we're getting a settler nation developing, of course, it quickly the, the, the focus becomes on the white labor that's available, implicating that group and making sure that they're feeling comfortable in the place that they've settled or invaded, um, which means that the needs of the indigenous peoples in Australia and other settler nations uh, diminishes and diminishes as the society um, takes greater shape as, as something like a settler society. The significance of tradition in all of this, the colonials and the Christians shared a negative view of indigenous cultures, barbaric heathen, denigrating their traditional pasts. The 20th century, we see a rise of decolonization ideologies aimed at reversing this. You get this, the whole notion of the black is beautiful, the small is good. And the cultural revival is survival. We get those kinds of notions that also come into place. And then tradition becomes, becomes re-emphasized in many of these places. So the construction of national identities that start to use elements of tradition as political symbols. And I think we get, we're in a really interesting period in Australia with regards to this and the ways in which indigenous imagery, indigenous traditions are starting to get incorporated into many of our major ceremonies into our meetings and so on. Um, the use of bush tucker is uh, foods and so on is, is another example of where we're starting to play with the, of starting to use these um, ideas and idioms in, in interesting ways. Of course, whether or not we call it, we can say that they're um, uh, productive. Well, it's not always going to be that. But again, these are the kinds of things that we can interrogate a little bit further as we move along. Tradition is a two-edged sword. It creates as well as dissolves social boundaries and conflicts. It can reignite. And anybody who knows anything about, say, something like the native title um, is, um, disputes that have gone on in Australia will know the ways in which people have had to become more traditional than they have actually might have actually been 
able to be in, in or, or even comfortable with necessarily in traditional society. Um, sorry, in contemporary society, should I say. Um, and there are all sorts of other different ways in which tradition, nah, it brings many advantages, but it, it can be it can be both inclusionary and exclusionary and it moves along in its different ways. Um, okay. So the purpose of this lecture, as I said, was to enhance appreciation of the concept of colonialism, particularly to try and invite you to think about the different types of colonialism, the different periods, and then of course, to think about the different dynamics that take place depending upon the sorts of societies that are being overrun by, um, by colonial, force, colonial forces. Investigating its practice, thinking through many of those uh, different things to contemplate the implications of colonialism and the ongoing implications of this. And the idea here is to get you to deepen your understanding of European colonialism, various impacts on colonized people in different parts of the world. You can only do so much in this time, as I've already said. Thank you for listening and uh, we'll keep going with the rest of the material.